morning. Amen? Amen. Yeah, if that didn't wake you up, I don't know what will. But now you can get comfortable and get ready to go to sleep. <laughs> it's so good to be in the house of the Lord on a Sunday. And we've been going through a series of, of, uh, of sermons uh, entitled Co- Connections That Matter. The first of that series was connecting with God. That is the most important connection you can possibly make. Amen? You connect with God. Then we talked about connecting with friends. It's important to have friends, isn't it? Uh, People to walk through life with us, people to to share our burdens with us, people to share our joys uh, with us. Uh, We have a brand new baby, baby alert, right over there. (laughs) Share the joy (laughs) a little bit later. Brand new baby with us. Pretty soon we'll have a couple more. I'm right there. Uh, you can see her in the foyer after church. <laughs> no. If you are fast. <laughs> uh, but Jessica is welcoming a brand new baby into this world. That's what a wonderful, uh, good news that is. Amen? Amen. Uh, good news. Uh, w- the bake sale for the twins uh, was uh, responded to very, very well. Uh, so I know... Brandon's family appreciates. Uh, Brandon's our youth guy here at the church. Him and Amber have two precious babies. The old, the biggest one is over four pounds now, right? Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, the, the other one is trying his best to catch up. <laughs> uh, that's, that's great news. It's good to be a family together with the Lord. Connect with friends. How important is it to connect with friends? But today we're going to talk about connecting with my mate. Connecting with the person that God has put in your life uh, to be in a marriage relationship uh, for as long as you both shall live. Uh, That connecting with my mate. Uh, As we talk about this, would you turn in your Bibles, please, to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to begin reading uh, there in uh, verse number uh, 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. If you're having trouble finding Genesis, just open the front cover <laughs> right after that. Uh, sometimes I need help finding books, so I, I just thought I'd try to help out. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Would you please stand in honor of God's word as we read it together? Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let him rule over the th- fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then if you would skip over with me to chapter two, please. Uh, chapter 2, and we'll begin reading in, in verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for a man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. And the men gave names to all the cattle and to all the birds of the sky and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from man and brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, but they were not ashamed. Father, we thank you uh, that you created us. Lord, that just as you created Adam and Eve and put them in a perfect garden, Lord, you created uh, each one of us and put us together. Father, I thank you for the institution of marriage. And I pray, Lord, that we would find ways to make the marriages that we are in last for a lifetime. Father, I pray for the husbands and the wives that are here today. 
for those young people that are looking forward to marriage sometime in the future. I pray, Lord, for even those of us who have, have been married for some time, Lord, that you might refresh and renew, that you might help us to understand and, and, and to be able to act upon the truth of your word today. Lord, that marriages may be strong. Lord, so that we can be the kind of examples to our dark world we need to be in our marriages. And we pray, Lord, that you'd help us connect with our mate today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Marriage and divorce. Uh, the, the statistics are, are pretty bad uh, sometimes. I look at this uh, chart that we just have uh, right up here. Uh, this starts in 1860. You see how many divorces there were back then? <laughs> they, you know, marriages were intended to last, and, and back then they lasted pretty well. Uh, you see that the Great Depression had a great uh, dip in marriages during that time. Uh, but you also see at the end of, of World War II, you see that great rise when the, the boys, came, when Johnny came marching home <laughs> and met Sally. <laughs> Uh, and the right great rise in marriages. There's also a little bit of a rise in divorce during that time. But look at this, this part right here. When the no-fault divorce laws were enacted, uh, the divorce rate took off again. Uh, and, and now you see today that it's, it's almost, uh, if you were to compare that, it's almost 50-50. It uh, doesn't mean that there's a 50% chance that your marriage isn't going to work. For Christians, the statistics are a little bit better than that. Isn't that good news? But honestly, too many marriages don't work today. And I think it's because we don't understand how to get along with our mate. We don't understand how to connect with our mate. I want to share with you what some things that the Bible says today about connecting with our mate. Now, this is a passage that we just read uh, a minute ago. Oh, oh, let me share this with you, too. Do you know that they, there's a, a new company called Swan Love, uh, and uh, it's named after uh, swans uh, who mate for life. You know, a swan will mate for life, and that mate dies. A swan never has a mate again. They mate for life uh, when they mate. Uh, and so the co-founder of the company, Scott Avery, told CNBC that... Uh, he came up with an, an idea that if you were to going to get married, that this company would give you $10,000 towards your wedding. Pretty cool, right? Would you like the name? Any young people here like to? <laughs> uh, it's Swan Love. <laughs> $10,000 towards your wedding. There was only one small stipulation, that if you ever got a divorce, you had to pay the money back. Now, they were just swamped with requests. Uh, but statistically, uh, but Emory University did a, a uh, study on divorce, a hazard of divorce. It's about 3.5 times higher for women who spend more than 20000 on their wedding than those who just spend 5000 to 10000 About three and a half times higher. I, I wonder if it's because they think it's about the ceremony and not about what happens after the ceremony. You see, sometimes we think of marriage as in this fairy tale thing, but you notice that all those fairy tale movies end when the couple getting married? Sometimes they say they live happily ever after, but that's the end of the movie. There was a guy who uh, was uh, very sick. Uh, he was in a coma. And he would come in and out of consciousness, and and uh, he uh, was uh, came became lucid, and he uh, his wife was sitting there beside him, and and he he said uh, began to to mutter. So she got real close to hear what he had to say, and this is what he had had to say: "You have been right there beside me through all the rough times. You were there when I got fired. You were there when my business failed. You were there when we lost the house." And you've been there by my side as my health has failed and I lay dying. Finally, he paused and he asked the question, and you know what? And so she wiped a tear from her eye and she leaned very close to hear his response and said, 
I think you're bad luck. <laughs> and then he went back into the coma. Now, I don't know this for sure, but it is rumored that he had marks on his body that weren't there before that time. <laughs> Marriage is not an easy thing. But marriage is God's plan and God's desire. Amen? Marriage is something that God intended. There's only two institutions that God made. God made the institution of marriage for our physical family. A husband and wife committed to each other for a lifetime. Uh, raising children and, and someday having grandchildren. And, and you know, that that nuclear family. And then the other institution they establish is what we're celebrating today, his church, brothers and sisters in Christ meeting together to love on each other and, and to, to worship and, and follow the God that, that draws us together. That's his other institution. Some say that he also created government, but I'm not willing to blame God for that. <laughs> but those two institutions are so vital and so important in our lives today. We're talking today about the marriage, the first institution. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 describe the, the marriage uh, of Adam and Eve, the, the marriage that God intends for all of us uh, to be able to have. You see, God had a plan. It says in this passage, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And God made them male and female. He had a plan, uh, male and female. He, he had a plan to make us, to create us, uh, and to uh, help us uh, to find each other. Uh, there is a sameness about man and woman, isn't there? Uh, this passage, uh, if we break it down, uh, it, it says some things about that sameness. Uh, that word bara, that Hebrew word, it means to create uh, from nothing, ex nihilo, uh, from nothing. It, it's a creation not like what is described in your science classes. Uh, if you believe you came from a monkey, that's fine for you to believe, but I have a richer heritage than that. <laughs> I believe I came from the heart and mind of God. I believe that all mankind was created. Adam, uh, the original word for man that is used here, when God created man in his image, that's that word Adam. It also becomes the name of the first man, Adam, as we know him. But that, that word representing all of mankind, God created man. And he created man as a part of his plan. Uh, a wonderful... Uh, creation. He created them male and female. There is a, a sameness before God. Whether you're male or female, God loves you just as much. God cares for you just as much. You're just a much, as much a part of God's creation, whether you're male or female. Uh, matter of fact, you are the pinnacle of creation. Uh, the passage that we read, as we read a little bit farther, we said... I uh, read about uh, how God brought all the animals before Adam uh, and God allowed Adam to name all the al animals. You know why I can say the word elephant and you think of this big gray thing? Because Adam named all the animals. <laughs> because we have a common understanding of what an elephant is. Uh, as God created all those animals, he began to bring them before man, before woman was created. He brought them one at a time or two at a time before man. And, and, and Adam gave them names. And I think he thought, there's Mr. Elephant and there's Mrs. Elephant. There's Mr. Camel and there's Mrs. Camel. There's Mr. Goose <laughs> and there's Mrs. Goose. <laughs> uh, there's Mr. Rabbit. And there's Mrs. Rabbit. That was about two seconds before there were a bunch of more of them. <laughs> but he brought them all before man, and man began to notice something, something that God already knew according to the scripture, that man needed a helpmate. Man began to recognize, oh, there's Mr. and there's Mrs. Wait a minute. I'm a Mr. Where's my Mrs.? I think God did that on purpose because men are dense. 
I mean, I hate to say it, but I know one personally. I think God wanted man to realize that he needed woman. God already knew it. God's already stated it, that man needed a helpmate. But God wanted man to realize how much he needed a helpmate. Do you realize that's always been a God, part of God's plan? Uh, to a man and a woman be joined together for a lifetime? It's always been a part of God's plan. He created man in the image of God, that imago Dei, that, that image of God that, that we bear. Uh, what does it mean? It means that we have a spirit like God. It means that we can reason like God. Uh, and we can be unreasonable sometimes as well. <laughs> it means that we have a relationship that we are drawn to relationships like God is. We're gone, drawn to relationship with Jesus. We're drawn to relationship also with our, our spouse. Uh, we were created in man's, in God's image. Man was created in God's image for a purpose. And yet there's a uniqueness about us as well. Uh, as the pinnacle of God's creation, as the height of his created order, because we are made in the image of of God, we can recognize how important and how unique each one of us is. Uh, Adam was created as a unique creation of God. Now, God could have taken some more dirt and made Eve, but he chose not to do that. He chose to took a, take a piece of Adam to make Eve. I, I think he wanted us to know that we were made of the same stuff. He wants us to know that there's a sameness about us. And I've heard a preacher say one time that he didn't take a piece of man's skull so that Eve was over Adam. He didn't take a piece of man's foot so that Eve would be under or trodden on by man. He took a piece of man's side so that Adam and Eve, so that man and woman could walk together through life uh, with a a co-standing before the Father and with a, a love for each other that would make them companions through all of life. Uh, no other part of God's creation was singled out and given authority and responsibility like man was. This passage says that, that you shall rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every creeping thing that creeps on the ground. It, we were given responsibility and, and authority uh, to rule. We are the pinnacle of his creation, and yet we're each unique. I want you to think of a key word here is value. God values you. God cares about you. God created you to be the person that you are. God created you uniquely. Whether you're a male or female, God created you. You have value before God. This other passage says uh, in verse 24, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And it goes on to say, uh, And the man and his wife were both naked, but they were not ashamed. Now let's take that apart a little bit. There's a priority mentioned there. There is a priority. You shall leave your father and mother. It's When you get married, it becomes a priority your spouse, your family becomes your first priority on a human level. Uh, I tell people all the time, the most important decision that you will make, ever make in life, is a decision for Jesus Christ. Amen? Because that determines where you're going to spend all of eternity, heaven or hell. The second most important decision that I tell young people all the time is who you're going to marry. Because as the first decision determines your happiness for all eternity, the second decision has something to do with your happiness right here and right now. Amen? Uh, and it's very important, that decision, because th that God has intended for a marriage to last for a lifetime. There has to be a leaving of the mother. Father and mother serve a great purpose. I was telling Sarah what great parents she has, and she had never heard that before. <laughs> she knows that. Uh, parents have a great purpose in your life. They set an example. 
They're there to support you. They're there to guide you. But when it comes time to marry, there needs to be a new priority in life. No longer is it your, your nuclear family. No longer is the family back home. It becomes the family that is with you. It becomes the, the spouse that you marry. That's a new priority. A man shall leave his father and mother. Uh, how important uh, that is that th there be a leaving. I've counseled with many couples over the years uh, who have never left mom and dad. They, they bring all their stuff in from their family and they think that has to be done that way. And when they have a problem, the first person they contact is mom or dad for an answer. Folks, the first person you contact once you're married ought to be your spouse, right? And if you don't, you're going to be in trouble <laughs> one way or the other. Mom and dad serve a purpose and they serve a place, but when it times for marriage, you have a new priority. A man shall leave his father and his mother and shall uh, cleave to his wife. The key word there is uh, focus. Our focus now becomes not on an interdependent relationship with mom and dad, but on an independent relationship with our spouse. We need to be connected to each other so that we can be strong when the difficult times come. Then there's a permanence. It speaks of a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Uh, what does it mean to cleave? I'm sorry. Uh, what does it mean to cleave? That word translated cleave means to be joined together. Uh, it literally means to be glued together. To be glued together. I had a carpenter friend up in, in uh, Portland who uh, taught me a lot about Finnish carpentry and, and he had a certain brand of glue that he believed in. Uh, and I was talking to him, you know, I, I don't know about gluing things together like that. And he said, here, let me show you. He took two two by fours uh, and he put some of this glue, it's like a liquid nails kind of a glue. He put that glue down and he put those two two before's together. No nails, no screws, anything like that. And he said, now uh, come back tomorrow and we'll see what happens. So we came back the next day to work on the church. That seems like all I ever do. <laughs> I'm a carpenter <laughs> at the church. And we came back the next day and, and uh, I tried my best to get those two two before's apart. And you know, I could make more than one piece, but I could not split that bond. That bond it was a, a bond that held, no matter what I tried, that bond held. Matter of fact, the fibers of the wood would come apart before that bond would. That's what it, God wants for our marriages. He wants us to cleave together so well that nothing can break us apart. No difficulty, no trial, uh, nothing can bring us to the point of wanting to split that bond. That's the kind of cleaving that we need together, be glued uh, together. It's, uh, folks, it's more than a feeling. Hollywood has an idea of love that, you know, if you, if you love somebody uh, while they're pretty and while they're nice, and then when they get older or they start having trouble, you don't love them anymore, or, or you love them while they make you look good, <laughs> <laughs> but when, when even they can't make up for how you look, then you get rid of them. You know, it's, it's feelings-based. You know, I used to love. I have no longer loved that person. That's not God's love. In a marriage situation, uh, we make a covenant, not a contract. A covenant, not a contract. A contract says, if you do this and this and this and this, then I'll do this, this, and this right? That's a contract. That's not the marriage relationship that God has planned for us. Ours is a covenant. God said to Israel, I will do this and do that. And God's going to fulfill every promise he made to Israel. You can bank on it. That's what the tribulation time is all about, ultimately, is God fulfilling his promises to Israel. You can bank on it. He's, gonna, he's made a covenant with Israel. And nothing's going to stop that. That's what we need to think of when we think of the marriage that we're in right now. That we have made a covenant with our spouse. 
and nothing can split us apart. We are glued together, we cleave to one another. The key word there is commitment. Are you committed to each other? Are you committed to the point that nothing can tear you apart? And then uh, there's also a unity. The two shall become one flesh. Uh, you know, when I see Brian, I expect to see Susie. When I see Susie, I expect to see Brian. Uh, when I see Dave, I expect to see Ruth. When I see Ruth, I expect to see Dave. There, there's just some, some marriages where, where they cleave together. Uh, and because of that cleaving, they become one. Now, I, I want you to know that that doesn't happen automatically. There, there's a closeness there. It doesn't come about just because it should be there. It comes about because you help it to be there, because you care about it being there. Have you ever known somebody that, <laughs> that if you ask them a question for their spouse, that they'll be able to tell you exactly what their spouse feels about that, that question? Now, the closest my wife gets to that is she finishes all my sentences for me. <laughs> and, and sometimes she's right, <laughs> and sometimes she's wrong. Uh, but you understand wh wh where that is. Uh, it, it's when you are so close, so much together, that it just seems natural that you be a couple, that, that you see one, you see the other, that if you know the wh what the one would say, the other would know what the other would say as well. Uh, those kinds of relationships. That's a goal, folks. That doesn't happen automatically. The key word there is time. Time. That doesn't happen on the wedding day. You don't become one flesh. It's not talking about the, the wedding night. It's, it's talking about a relationship that builds and builds and builds and builds until you are in a special closeness and unique kind of love for one another that that you're just glued together, that everything is going to be uh, together from that point forward. And then there's this intimacy. Uh, that, that next passage, isn't that strange? They were both naked and they were not ashamed. Now, I bet you figured out what that verse means, right? What do you think? They were both naked. It means they didn't have any clothes on. <coughs> Pretty obvious, right? They didn't have any clothes on. Is that God's intent that we understand they were both naked? I, I really think that God has more for us in that verse than just an understanding that they didn't have clothes on in the Garden of Eden. In other words, the temperature was so good they didn't have to have a winter coat. <laughs> That's not his intention. His intention was that we see the second part of that verse. They were both naked, and they were not ashamed. They were not ashamed. I believe that that's a reference to a kind of intimacy that Adam and Eve had before sin that they would never have again in their life. A kind of intimacy where there was nothing that wasn't known about them. A kind of closeness that they enjoyed that, that nothing uh, could describe it except there was no shame. There was no shame. It was a pure relationship. There was nothing to be ashamed of. It was a pure relationship with each other. Uh, they were not self-conscious. They were open to each other, completely open to each other. Now, I, I have a little problem with that. When my wife comes by, when I'm, uh, especially if I don't have a shirt on or something like that, <laughs> I, I can only do this so long. <laughs> I want to look my best, right? <laughs> but to let it all hang out. <laughs> I mean, just to be yourself. They were completely open with each other, and, and they had nothing to be ashamed. You know, I believe it really means they had nothing to hide from each other. There was such an intimate knowledge of each other. There was nothing to hide. I think if you're going to have the marriage that God wants you to have, if you're going to be able uh, to have that connection that God wants you to have with your mate, there needs to be a complete level of trust. There needs to be a, a, a complete level of knowledge 
about each other, and there's nothing hidden except at birthdays and Christmas. Only times there's anything hidden, right? But such a relationship that you can trust one another. My wife and I enjoy a tremendous level of trust. I, if she's late or I'm late, we don't have to worry about what the other person is doing. That's built over a long time, that level of trust, that level of, of intimacy and oneness. Are you at that level in your marriage where there's nothing to hide? No secrets? Nothing between you at all? Uh, that's the kind of level God wants every marriage to be in. And that, the key word there is sharing. But let me tell you, we did, didn't read this passage. I want to tell you, this marriage looks really good right now, doesn't it? In the end of chapter 2, things look pretty wonderful for Adam and for Eve. But what happens in chapter 3? A little word, three letters, that changes everything. Sin enters into the relationship. With that sin comes division. With that sin comes problems. Now we live in a world where of sin. We live in a world where there's all kinds of temptations. We live in a world where there's all kinds of things uh, to lead us astray and to destroy our marriages. I want to tell you what really saved my marriage. My wife and I had been married for Oh, a year maybe at the time. We were living up in Fort Collins. Um, the company had moved me up there. My wife was living her life down at the movie theater. Most of that was her job and, and stuff. And I was living my life at the quarry. And uh, my good friends were up there, so I'd go out with them. And, and she'd come home late at other times. And, and things just weren't working. You can imagine what that would be like. It got so bad that we decided we were going to get a divorce. We are just arguing all the time. We decided it would be better if we weren't even married. And so we loaded up in the car, and we decided we were going to stop at each of our parents and tell them that we were going to get a divorce. We made the mistake of stopping at my mom and dad's first. We didn't know that my mom and dad's church were having a series of meetings called a revival if we had known that, because we were not trying at all to live close to the Lord at that point, we would never have stopped there first. But they insisted that we go with them. We didn't have a chance to tell them uh, what we were going to do. They insisted that we go to the revival. So we decided, well, we'll tell them after church. We'll tell them after church. Well, God had arranged for the evangelist to preach a sermon said what kind of Christian are you he said are you a good Christian I think my wife and I would both agree at that point that we were not good Christians he described what a good Christian was like he described a closeness of relationship and a lifestyle that had become foreign to us he said are you a bad Christian his second point and I thought I remember when I accepted Christ as my Savior at age 12. And I'm telling you, it was such a real experience. I have no doubt that Christ saved me when I was 12. But I had not lived for Christ shortly after that. And I had gone my own way, and I had lived according to my own desires. And I realized at that point, I was not a good Christian. I was a bad Christian. I... I was doing a horrible job of representing Jesus Christ to anybody around me. His third point was, are you no Christian at all? And that's when my wife was convicted. She got up at the invitation time and ran out the back door. <laughs> and I went and got the evangelist and chased her down <laughs> to a room back behind the church. You see, my wife had gone forward at a church when her friends had gone forward. And she was baptized. When she was having problems with her dad because her dad was a music leader at the church, she knew that it would make dad happy if she went forward. So she went forward again. 
and made dad happy. But she had never asked Jesus to be her personal Lord and Savior. And that night she did. She became a Christian. And I repented from my sins and where I had fallen short. And I renewed my commitment to Jesus Christ. And we decided to give our marriage one more chance. We've been given our marriage one more chance now for 43 years. You know, God, God saved our marriage. I'm telling you, if we had not met Jesus that night, we would not be married today. Because she's hard to live with. <laughs> Which, by my making that statement, you know who's really hard to live with. <laughs> you understand, Jesus Christ is the answer. If you're having difficulty in your marriage and you know that both of you are Christians, get together on your knees before God and ask Him to renew that commitment in your life. If you're having trouble in your marriage and one of you is not a Christian and it's you, get right with Jesus. Ask Him to be your Lord and Savior and He can save your marriage. Whatever it is, maybe you're here today and you have a fairly good marriage. Everything's going pretty good for you right now. But you know that it could be so much better. Seek the Lord. Jesus is the one who can make your marriage strong. He's the one that can make your life better. You see, the answer for my marriage was Jesus. I believe the answer for all marriages is Jesus. I know there are people who aren't saved who are married for many, many years. I know that, I, I'm just saying, if you want a happy, wholesome, if you want a marriage that's really going to bless you, start with Jesus. Start with Jesus. If you want to be able to make it through the tough times, if you want to be able to put up with somebody when they're not as lovely as they were on your wedding day, <laughs> start with Jesus. Jesus can make all the difference. He can help your marriage to be better than it is. He's the one that can help your marriage to be strong. Jesus. So today, where are you in your relationship with your mate? Perhaps you're still looking. Look carefully. Look for someone who knows Jesus. Look for someone who already has that settled. That'll make a big difference. If you're here today and, and you are married, but you're unhappy, Look to Jesus. Let him feed you so that you can feed your marriage. Let him satisfy you and give you joy so that you can give joy to your spouse. Look to Jesus. Whatever it is today, look to Jesus. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I'd love to share with you how you can know him as your personal Lord and Savior. I'm going to stand down here in front. The band's going to come and, and play a song for us. I'm going to stand down here for a couple verses. If God's spoken to your heart, you're welcome to, to come and talk to me about anything he said. You're welcome to come and pray. Maybe you, to husbands and wife, might just want to dedicate your marriage to Jesus today. That'd be a good thing to happen. You could just come here to the altar and pray. You can do that where you're sitting as well, if that's what God leads you to do. But look to Jesus for the answer. He's the one that's going to make it happen and make it work. Would you bow with me, please, in prayer? Our Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that, that you love us even when we're not lovely. Lord, that you care for us even when we don't care for ourselves. Lord, that, that you created us uniquely special to be in relationship with someone else you created uniquely and special. Lord, we pray that you would give to us a desire to make our marriages especially what they should be before you that we would truly love our spouse, that we would truly care for our family. Lord, that you would give us a heart to seek you first and to then, Lord, share what you give us in this most important relationship, human relationship that we have. Father, I pray that every marriage here today would be strengthened as we look to you for answers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.